it is a great honor to be interviewing one of my friends for, gosh, I, all the way back in the day. I think I met you 25 years ago. And I, uh, I, you, I, am, I no. am truly humbled. And I, I just want to say that uh, you were my original inspiration. <laughs> you, you started my, my interest in practice management. Uh, just quickly, I, my brother, Mike, my older brother, Mike, uh, he's five years older, so he had already been practicing when I just graduated. One of the first things he did was give me a tape when I graduated of you speaking at, at an uh, ADA convention. Back when you wanted to be the Jimmy Hoff of dentistry, I had never heard anything <laughs> like it. It was just so funny. It was just so, just such a blast, just so unusual, so different, so candid, so, so different and so honest that uh, you, you sparked my original interest. Well, you know what? The uh, going back through all those uh, the turmoil days of my early speaking career, because everywhere I, I mean, half the places I spoke at for the first ten years, literally put into writing. They'd never have me back ever again, and all the uh, complaints. But the the, iron the ironic thing is, you always had standing room only, and people overflowing, and then they ban you. Well, well, can I can I can I tell you the only the only thing that finally explained it to me? Because you had to be me to live through this. I mean, you, you're sitting there lecturing everybody's busting up laughing and then uh -huh. when it's all over uh the, the the people who have you said you know you offended people and you you said fart and damn and you know all this stuff like that but it was it was watching the movie private parts and howard stern um stayed true to himself he knew these jokes were funny he knew everybody in the construction site was laughing and the only people that had a problem with it were the station owners and they just kept firing and firing and firing and you got to watch the movie and he just stayed true to himself and finally one day one radio station said well you know i don't like him but a lot of people do and and now he's the highest paid uh public or radio personality right. in the world on sirius and uh so i always said um my, my thinking when I lectured is that uh, I wanted to uh, talk to you as uh, you were my friend. And if I was your friend, I'd tell you exactly what I thought, and I wanted you to lie to it. And I always thought growing up in America that all the politicians were lying, you know, all the business. And anybody that came up to you with a suit was trying to sell you something. And, and I just thought candid honesty. I'd rather have someone honest with me and not agree with a thing he says, but I'd like the person because he was honest. And uh, – you know, so I was, I just, I never had a political correct bone in my body. It, it was so refreshing. And uh, to, again, I wasn't offended by anything, but I, I think the proper word would be irreverent, which is, I think, a good thing. And that was another to, weird to, thing I would, I would see at the dental convention. So you'd go to this dental convention and one of your buddies would show up in a suit and tie with PowerPoint and give the most boring presentation of your life. And you just couldn't even stay awake. And then as soon as the seminar was over, We'd all go hit the uh, hotel bar, and then the drinks would start flying, and the cussing would start flying, and the great stories would start flying, and then you'd have a blast from like five to two in the morning. And I think, why wasn't that the lecture? You know, if that had been the lecture, we, we, that would have been awesome. The greatest sin is to bore, and the best teachers are those that spark an interest to learn more because you can't really learn anything just sitting there. And if you turn that spark on to, in, in someone, that's the greatest accomplishment, and that's what you've done for so many of us. Well, um, we should just have a mutual admiration club since we both admire each other so much. Uh, I feel like we're on the Merv Griffin show. You know, <laughs> you're, you're so great. I'm so <laughs> Everyone's so great. So, uh, so before we get into this, <clears throat> all your expertise, I, I just want to sit there. Um, there's 5,000 kids just graduated from dental school last week, you know, and I went to the AT Still graduation over here in Mesa, and all these young kids are walking out, and you and I, we've basically been in this um, profession coming up on uh, three decades. You got out in 90, Believe so you've been right. out 25 years. I've been out 28 years. Um, first of all, I want to ask you from your practice manager expertise, what is the state of the American dental industry? Especially how it, how it was when you got out of school to now, and what's your diagnosis of it today, and where do you think it'll be uh, when all the graduates uh, are in their 50s like you and me? Well, um, it seems like just yesterday that you and I were the uh, young graduates, but uh, I, I still think it's a great choice. I, 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 frankly, I think the whole country's in trouble, but um, I think dentistry may still be the best choice, and uh, I think there's still a lot of opportunity out there. What I would tell a young graduate is that any experience is good experience, um, whether they learn what to do or what not to do, and get as much experience as you can. 
And you might have to kiss a lot of frogs before you find the right mentor, but find the right mentor. And uh, it's still out there. Yeah, and, and experience comes in different uh, Like Like so many, the most common email I see on, to me or on the message board is, um, I got a dental school. I'm going back to my small town in Patuka, Kansas, and there's two associate positions, and one will pay me 25% of uh, production, and the other one will pay me 30% of production, but I have to pay the la half the lab bill. Uh, which one should I take? And I'm always like, dude, really? It's your decision's going to come. Well, one teach the one you, with the patients. Yeah, it will. Well, one teach you practice management. Well, one teach you how to do endo. Well, one teach you how to place an implant. Well, you know, mentoring. There's there's more to life. I mean, you already are under two hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt. I'd rather you have a job and make a little less money or a lot less money and and just keep learning great things. I I think the biggest part of a um, looking for a job and associate, I'd want to go in there and say, doctor, how many wives have you had? Uh, doctor, how long has your average staff been here? You know, in America, the average American only holds their job three years. I'd want to find a doctor whose average staff had been there at least six. Um, you know, do you have recall? Do any of your patients come back for a cleaning? And if he says, I'm on my fifth white and I'm living, and I'm living with my uh, first cousin and, you know, the longest staff member has been here two years and I have 8,000 charts and a part-time hygienist, I, I don't care if he paid you 200,000 a year, just run. You are right on. And, but even financially, I just want to point out that there's nothing more misleading than the statistic of the, uh, of the percentage that an associate is paid. Because in some offices, maybe you're paid 50% of production, and yet the owner dentist doesn't want to give you any patience. Versus you're in some booming practice that gives you everything, and they pay you a much smaller percentage. You're, you're going to end up making more money there financially. But I further agree with you that the experience is much more important. And, and the other thing is, if you're going to be truly patient-centered, I mean, you know, your office is paid for for 168 hours in a week, and it's only open 40 hours a week because it's doctor-centered. And Americans are used to 24-hour Walgreens and hospital emergency rooms don't close down on Christmas or Hanukkah. There, you know, you can, you know, airplanes. I mean, you catch a red-eye flight from Phoenix to Chicago at midnight. And when your office closes at five o'clock, so group, so there's a lot of pressures towards group practice. And I just can't tell you how many people I've seen um, come out of school and they're in a group practice making like 200, 225. And it's like three doctors sharing this practice and, and they're covering, you know, hours, six days a week, but they have to own their own practice. They have to own their own practice. Just like you let out the dog in the front yard, he has to pee on all four corners. And then they, and then they go out to this small little dentist focused practice and they make $125,000 a year and they're stressed out the rest of their life. And they walked away from a $250,000 job with complete liquidity and no responsibility. And, and when you go on vacation, you got two other guys covering your emergencies. And so, yeah, there's a lot of, lot of, lot of I really feel the most important thing about these graduates is um, they're, they're, they're going to make some of the biggest decisions in their life. You know, are you going to marry a stay home mom that spends 10,000 a month? Or are you going to marry one of them women dentists in the class? Uh, that you graduated with, that'll make 10000 a month. I mean, that's a game changer of like $5 million over your career. You know, rule number one, marry one of the girls in your class. You know what I mean? I mean, how, how do, I have to, do I have to go down there and arrange the marriage for you? Um, and num number two, um, gosh, these guys will get It was the best thing I ever did. I mean, I mean not, You married not, a girl in your class? Well, not in my class, but she's also a dentist. And no wife of mine can stay home. I mean, we can't both be like that watching daytime TV all, all day. That's not going to work. One of us has to work. I'm just kidding. But no, no, I did marry a dentist, and you're right. That's a great decision. And, you're, and your brother's a dentist. And was your dad yep. a dentist too? He was. And, uh -huh. and that's what we, we see around the world. I mean, you know, there's 7 billion people, and probably 6 billion out of 7 billion work in the family business. I mean, if you're, if you're born to an uh, African goat herder, you do goats. And uh, so there's a lot of family tradition in occupation. And how does how, well, that work for your family? Well, with you too, I just want to point out, although your dad wasn't a dentist, he was a business owner. And you grew, up, you grew up knowing the entrepreneur's life, knowing hard work, knowing customer service, and applied all those lessons, of course, to dentistry. Yeah. And I, 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 you, I, I've noticed that in staff too, like Lorraine, my all-time superstar, she grew up in the restaurant industry. Um, so I think that's not you? surprising. Yeah. And what, what does uh, she do now? She's working mostly with, with Real World Endo, but we also work together. Um, she's helping them uh, run their seminars 
mostly. Fantastic. Uh, but again, I think it was that background growing up in her family's restaurant industry, uh, restaurant business, just like you, that uh, was the ultimate training for dentistry. Uh, absolutely. And, and you see it all the time. When the dentist, uh, when the mom stayed home and made cookies and the dad worked on the line at GM, the dentist got out of school and they were clueless. But if their dad was a dairy farmer or a corn farmer or owned a restaurant or anything that had to uh, free enterprise, uh, they came out crushing it. And I always thought the dentists who uh, grew up in dentistry, uh, man, they had two legs up because uh, just like in dental school, I can't believe my undergraduate degree um, wasn't to become a hygienist because the people, the dozen in our class that got a hygiene degree first, they already learned half of dental school. And then during dental school on Saturdays, they could work, you know, for $40 an hour, eight to five. And I was in there at Walgreens for $3.25, not learning anything about dentistry. I, and, and I see that in med school too. I, I was talking to my doctor the other day and first she became a uh, CPA, then she became a CNA, then an LPN, then an RN, then a phlebotomist, and then a PA, and then a physician. I mean, she, made, she, she graduated no debt. I mean- Well, I, I used to tell girls that I was a CPA back when I was a car parking attendant. <laughs> I was single. <laughs> this stuff works. Just a little tip for the single listeners out there. So what made, what made you get into office magic uh, 25 years ago? What, what, what got you interested in that flair? And that well, I, I was already interested in practice management, uh, perhaps, as I mentioned, from being so entertained by you. But just blind luck, I, our family practice accidentally hired Lorraine, not as an office manager, but as a just entry-level position. And... Um, you know, she had had no dental experience. Uh, she came in and wanted to do everything differently and stuff that I thought was crazy. She wanted to, st to start talking about money on the phone before we ever met the patient. And uh, she was so enthusiastic. She seemed so competent. We didn't want to tell her no, even though we thought a lot of it was crazy. And then I was observing her. I, I, I would see all the patients, not just throwing money at her, but hugging her, saying how nice she was. And, you know, we were sending out uh, more than 500 bills a month back then. And uh, just seeing all the changes that she made and how all the patients loved her, even though she was doing stuff that seemed counterintuitive or that we thought that patients wouldn't like, um, that got me interested in figuring out what exactly she was doing. And we started uh, recording the phone calls and writing down the things she was saying, trying to train everyone else on the team. And that turned into uh, books and tapes. And now here with you. Well, you know, you um, going back over, you know, if we were looking at uh, Hall of Fame changers in dentistry, you were really the one, you're the first one that I ever heard of beating the doorways of going to a statementless practice. And I have to tell you, 25 years ago, back in the day, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, um, that, that just sounded crazy. And what mm -hmm. you explain to the entire industry is that, you know, like right now, the ADA says that the average overhead uh, and then they have great statistics, by the way. They, I mean, they, they, they uh, right. you know, statistics comes down to most important thing. How do you choose your sample? What is your sample size? If I randomly pull your name, do I throw the name back in the, the hat? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. they have outstanding statistics. And they're saying 64% overhead is the average overhead uh, for general dentists in the United States. And so that's two thirds. And what dentists don't understand is that if you only collect 95%, you think in college, you know, in chemistry and organic and physics, a 95% is an A. But if you don't collect 5% and you have two thirds overhead, that means 10% of your overhead is just from the free dentistry you did on people who had no intention at day one of ever paying you. And, and then the dentist comes back to you and says, well, you know, I got high overhead. And it's like, dude, you're, like you said, when Lorraine walked in your office, you were setting out 500 statements a month. So you gave them the hamburger, they ate it, they went home and, and chewed it up and swallowed it and digested it. And then we're paying someone about five, six, seven dollars a statement, mailing them to the snail mail, begging them to pay their bills. And you reversed that and you led the charge in that. And, and the patients were happier and the stress reduced. It, it was just better for everybody. I, I, of course, I don't want to pretend that you're, you're too kind. I don't want to pretend that I did that alone. I, I stood on the steps of, I uh, stood on the uh, shoulders of people like, uh, Gary Takas, I remember one of my, uh, back, way back when he had a column in Dental Economics, he said, uh, payment success begins with the belief that you deserve to be paid for your efforts. That was big for me. Um, you know, if, if you can't collect it, don't produce it. Wow, that was Gary Takas yeah. wrote a column like that? Back that in was the, day? the first time I read it, and that had a, a huh. big effect on if me. If you can yeah. find it on Google, send it to me, because he lives up the oh. street from me. I'll go, I'll go pin it to his front door. 
This was pre Google, <laughs> but it's probably there somewhere. <laughs> Well, you know, um, you know, it's um, you, you also said it was uh, you, you saw what Lorraine was doing. It was counterintuitive. And, and yeah. um, mo most all success is like, you know, you're born a social animal that is only going to survive with the group. So you're born to, to, you know, be passive and low key and and you want to play well with others. So it's and and, and, um, and it's just very counterintuitive uh, to be um, offensive or to say, well, I want my money now because you're, you're hardwired to just say, oh, whatever you want to do. Whatever you want to do. I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a co-monkey, cat, dog, ape. I just want to please you. And they're just I'm the afraid. worst, Howard. I will get into taxi cabs and I'll say, wherever you're going, I don't want to take you out of your way. Because, you know, I just don't want to deal with the whole confrontation. <laughs> 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 We've all got to be more assertive. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and so a lot of success counterintuitive. Another thing is that um, people who own their own business or become doctors, physicians, or lawyers usually are hardwired to be the 400-pound gorilla. And the 400-pound gorilla that got you to become a doctor, dentist, lawyer, um, business owner, um, that's not the delegating type. And that's the controlling type. You want to control everyone around you. And all and these I, successful I, I people delegate in. everything. You made a great point before about how associates can do very well. And um, I, I think most everyone is given the advice that they need to be their own boss. A lot of us have parents who convince all of us that everyone is better off being their own boss. And my parents gave me great advice, and it was probably good advice for me. But I think that not everyone is cut out to be their own boss. Um, and there are, you, as you pointed out, you can do very, very well as an associate. And uh, even today, perhaps you have to work in more than one office. But uh, there's still extraordinary opportunity out there. Well, look at Clear Choice. Uh, that, that's the, I mean, not Clear Choice. What, what's the big implant company where they're doing four on the floor? Uh, they, they come uh, in. I, and, I, I, uh, Brycan. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. Implant Centers in of America. No, no, not Brycan. I know who you mean. I just attended a seminar and I can't place it yeah, right now. Yeah, so, so there's, there's several chains that um, will come in and yeah. do a uh, million dollars. Uh, but basically, a lot of these chains realize that with ophthalmologists, there's 5,000 ophthalmologists, but 400 of them right. do 99% of all the LASIK operations. Uh, uh -huh. So only 400 are going to say, hey, I'm going to buy a million-dollar laser and get on TV and radio and billboards and ramp up. And so basically 95% ophthalmologists say, I, I, I can't compete with that. And um, it's, it, the, these implant companies are doing that. And, um, and the reason um, they can do it is because they will find implantologists in um, 50 miles up the street in a small town that needs more work. And so they're getting periodontists and oral surgeons from surrounding small towns to come into the big downtown LA, Phoenix, Denver, and slug out a bunch of implants. But, but yeah, um, I think, well, you know, I'll go back to, you said not everybody's cut, cut out to be owner. You know, I, 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 if I write another book and I want to talk about your book, um, I wrote my book on complicate business. Uh, you only manage three things, people, time, and money. You make something, sell something, watch numbers, but my, I, can't I, wait to read it. <clears throat> I want to write a book called the giggle factor because when you traveled around the world like I have, like I'm going to Australia again next month, and I mean, it'll be like the fifth time I've gone down there. When, you, when you've been to 50 countries, it seems like the richest countries, the people are all stressed out of their mind. I mean, United States, Germany, uh, you know, Korea, Japan, Singapore. I mean, these people are, uh, and they all got TMJ and migraines and lower back and irritable bowel and angina. And, 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 you're, and they're supposed to be the happy ones because they, they make all this money. Then when you go to like Brazil and Shenzhen and the back streets of Kathmandu and everybody's just giggling and they're, and they're poor. And I look at America, it's like all the kids, they're just all giggling. They go to the park. They still play make-believe. They're swinging in high school. But all society says, oh, no, no, no. You got to get a career and get married and have a bunch of kids. And then they're just like freaked out for 40 years. And then you don't see them smile or laugh again until the retirement, the kids are gone, they get a divorce, they're single back home and free, and they're like, oh my God, how that, what the hell was that? And that's what I, I, I call an associate. I mean, some of these people just drive to work without a care in the world because they got a Lorraine running the whole show. They got a group practice. They, they get to work five minutes before their first patient. They just crush it all day long, and, and they're making 200, two and a quarter, 240 with no stress, and then they're like, oh, this can't be good because it's no stress and I'm having fun, and I'm giggling, and I'm laughing. Let's see if we can ruin that. I, I couldn't agree more. If you truly, if, if your dream is to own a practice, by all means, you should, even if you end up making less as a result. You should follow your dream. But uh, I think some people 
follow that thinking it's their dream when it wasn't necessarily. They, they shouldn't feel obligated to do that. And I, I also want to say that going into uh, successful offices, uh, every consultant will tell I mean, you know, I, I know all of them. I think I've had, I probably had dinner with every consultant and their spouse in the last 25 years, several times. They'll all tell you that when they walk into a dental office, they can smell in one second if they're crushing it or not. And it's because the first first they run into is Lorraine. It's high energy. Mm -hmm. It's fun. People are throwing money at her. People are hugging her. It's just the whole atmosphere is just karma, energy, positive. And then the other nine dentists across the street, uh, you walk in there and it's like some weird library. You know what I mean? Happiness is a moral obligation because it affects others. It and, affects people around you. And why is it that when every, anybody talks about the U.S. Constitution, which was one of the greatest pieces of technology ever invented, you know, 1776, um, which is ironic. It came out the uh, same year as the first economic treaties, the Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. What's even weirder is that Adam Smith and the Declaration of Independence were both written by a 32-year-old Scot. So uh, economics in America has a lot to do with two, two 32-year-old Scots. Um, but it, it is a... Um, it's amazing how everybody always talks about freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, right to bear arms. And it's like, I, I, I read that constitution and what I'm seeing is, is pursuit of happiness. Be happy, uh -huh. you know, and you don't have the right to live across the street from me and make me unhappy. You know, if I'm not bothering you and you're not bothering me, let's be happy. And pursuit of happiness is something that's often overlooked in dentistry. You know? Absolutely. Um, I, I don't know what to, to add other than I think you're referring to the Declaration of Independence. Right, right. Um, so, An equally important document. Right, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Hey, um, <laughs> what made you write a book? Um, is this uh, a memoir or what, what, what made you sit down and write your latest book? I, oddly, I think the two of us simultaneously had the same inspiration, which was to go through, from what I understand, I, 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 your, your book isn't out yet, but from what I understand, no, my book's through. out. My book, my book's oh. out. I'm just pre-selling. I, I'm not gonna run. I don't. I'm not gonna print them until I have the orders in because I don't know how many I should print. And there's huge savings on print. And uh, well, so I, I need an ebook because I don't want to pay for the printing at all. Yeah, I did you one better. Right. But uh, um, and that's the future. And I actually, um, according to Amazon, the future is audiobooks. So what I need to do is uh, I'm, I'm gonna go in the uh, session and just read that book. Are you gonna do yours in audiobook? It, I'm, I'm going to do that too, and I I love audio. That's what I do myself. I listen to my uh, through my iPhone all day, to books right. and podcasts. Uh, so much easier than, than reading. I think possibly because we because we're dentists, we're so dependent on our eyes all day. The last thing I want to do when I get home uh, is to read instead of uh, listen. It's so Absolutely. much easier. Yeah, Absolutely. but from what I read about your book, you went through all of your stuff and stripped out the dental and made it applicable to everyone. That's exactly what I did. It's the best of office magic. I just went through everything and made it non-dental specific. Of course, since my background is dentistry, it's all st you know particularly applicable to dentistry. But I tried to make it for everybody, even your kids. Just uh, you know, good advice for everyone. Uh, well, tell us some of the highlights. Uh, you were talking about uh, three magic words for instant motivation. Um, this is going to sound fawning or, or that I'm pandering, but again, I learned this from you. Uh, when you were talking about uh, dentists being burned out, not wanting to go to the, the dental office, and yet they won't fork over for some per, uh, particular instrument or technology that they might enjoy. And you're, you're the living embodiment of you go to work to play <laughs> instead of to work. And uh, that, that's what we all have to do. And uh, I, I, in fact, I wanted to ask you, because I know that you lost, I think, 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Um, I don't know the specifics of how you did that, but I assume that instead of telling yourself that you have to exercise, you told yourself that you get to exercise and you, you found something that made it fun or turned it into a game like you, like you do with dentistry. So you have a real gift for that, and uh, it rubbed off on me. So then what are the so, three magic words? The, the three magic words are I get to instead of I have to. Instead of, and if you think about uh, someone in a wheelchair – if you were to tell them that you have to exercise, that person might remind you that you get to exercise. You get to go jogging or play basketball or, or whatever it is that, that, that you might enjoy. And again, that's why the uh, audiobooks and podcasts are so much more enjoyable for me than reading because I can do it at the same time as I'm doing those other things. 
Well, you know, I think um, I think that pathology on the extreme really helps explain the healthy human. I mean, a palm tree doesn't laugh or cry or run. It's not hardwired. So when you see a human and some are so depressed they can't get out of bed, that means everyone can get a little uh, upset. When you see 30,000 Americans kill themselves, you know that everybody has thoughts like, oh my God, if that happened to me, I'd kill myself. And um, humans need a lot of motivation and they need a lot of inspiration. Uh, life is challenging. The hardest thing about life can be getting through it. And, uh, and, and, and you know, Southwest Airlines, hire on attitude, train for skill. It's like, we just, we just want someone who has a good attitude. We, we can teach them. We can serve drinks and pull down the fire chute and administer oxygen. We, we can teach them how to fly a plane. What we can't teach you, though, is an attitude. And that's got to be an inside job. And so many people blame all their problems on their mom, their dad, their grandpa. My God, it's crazy. It, it's a struggle for everyone. And I just want to call you out one more time. I'll never forget many years ago, a dentist contacted you who was suicidal. And what you did was rather than keeping it secret, you let everybody know about it and brought it out for discussion. Again, everyone struggles. Not everyone's happy all the time. Our job is to, to try to be. And, uh, I, well, again, last year, last year in Phoenix, uh, we had three, uh, and it, it's it's usually two or three a year, and uh, I um, I had one back in the day. I think it was, uh, oh my god, I'm thinking '95, and uh, and he lived an hour on the other side of the town, and it was like one o'clock in the morning, and he called me, and he wanted me to, uh, and he was he was telling me he wouldn't leave a message for his daughter. I said, well, you know what, I I make audio cassettes. Why don't I just come over and record it? He goes, you do that for me? Oh, my God. I went over there. Guns on the table. Crazy. I mean, it's just crazy. Getting through life's tough. And I, I uh, loved him like a brother. And uh, But, uh, yeah. So, lead, leadership in one lesson. How are you going to do leadership in one lesson? Well, I, I used to play a, a clip in my seminars from uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. There's a great uh, scene in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest where McMurphy, um, Jack Nicholson, uh, is told by Nurse Ratched, the big nurse, that no, he's not allowed to watch the World Series. And um, what he does, uh, out of frustration, he sits down, he pretends that the World Series is on in front of the blank television that's turned off, and he just starts announcing it. And he announces it with so much enthusiasm, he's so convincing, it sounds like such a real exciting game that all the other inmates, all the other... Uh, patients in the mental hospital crowd around and they're hanging on his every word because he just does it with such enthusiasm and that's that's leadership in one lesson that if you know where you're going other people will follow and you can actually observe this same behavior in sled dogs if the lead dog shows any sense of uh, being lost the other dogs will stop following him they won't follow him anywhere but if you're committed to something if you're unconditionally committed and this gets back to the uh, young dentist um you know that we talk about uh, let's say their real goal is to have their own successful practice. How badly do they want that? That is, the real question is, what are you willing to sacrifice to get what you say you want? Are they, for example, willing to move to where there might be an incredible opportunity? You know, we all want certain things, but the real question is, what are we willing to sacrifice to make that happen? That's what will tell us how badly we want it. And uh, another dental application, um, Larry Wingett says, um, people don't care that they believe what you're saying. They care much more that you believe what you're saying. So in other words, if we're trying to educate a patient or persuade them to, to do something, if we don't believe it ourselves, you know, whether it's about payment or dentistry or, or anything, if we don't believe it ourselves, the, the, the patient will pick up on that. But if we think this is a great payment option, or we think this is the best dentistry, the patient can detect, can detect that too. They care much more that you believe what you're saying than they do that they believe what you're saying. <laughs> that is so true. You just, yeah. you just took me back to, uh, in 1994, I kept um, writing these great articles and sent them to all these magazines, but unlike uh, Gary Takis, that, that no one was publishing mine. <laughs> and, 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 and so finally, I'd be at these conventions and I finally got to meet the people that were denying my articles. And I realized, oh, my God, they're, they're not even dentists. Their boss is even a dentist. The, the, these companies are owned by – That's how Dental by, Town started? I didn't know that. Yeah, the, the, these corporations, they'll, they'll have like 80, 80 magazines. And one's like dentists and then firemen and hygienists and nurse. And it was just a vertical. And I thought, oh, my God, the only time these people see the dentist is 
when they get their teeth cleaned. So I thought, oh, I'll set up my own. And everybody told me in 94, they go, well, you can't do that because these are, these are multi-million dollar companies that own hundreds of magazines and they will crush you. And I said, yeah, but I'll do it 12 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't have to make a penny on it. I, I mean, I'll do this. If I do this 12 hours a day, seven days a week for 30 years and don't plan on making a penny, how, how are you going to compete with that? And that thing, I had lost $1 million before it stopped losing. That's how committed I was because I just loved it. I just thought what I was doing was the most fun thing I was, uh, I'd ever done. Well, I just learned a great story. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought finding these uh, great Pe real people like you in the trenches, real people like you, like Lorraine, real, real people. And, you know, not some big fancy practice and Key Biscayne or Beverly Hills working on movie stars. I'm talking about real world stuff in real world, rural and middle America. And it was just so cool. And it was so fun. And my, my, I got all were, of us doing it for you for free. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, Brilliant. and, and my guys, uh, my, my heroes back then probably, um, how, when's the last time you heard the name Earl Eastap? Are you old enough to remember that guy? I knew my parents were huge uh, followers of, oh, of his. Oh yeah, and he was this country gold guy, and I, um, I, I and uh, you know, just down old hillbilly stuff. That's uh -huh. how people worked in Texas. You know what I mean? And it was just, it was country gold. And I had so much fun, and I, I, I never cared about any of the competition. And now here it is. Uh, that started in 1994. Now it's 2015, and all the third parties rank us as the number one dental magazine uh, in America. That's amazing. Yep. My dad loved early step. We still have the newsletter somewhere. I'm not sure where, but there's oh somewhere. Oh my God. You know, someone needs to find all of those and digitize them. That, them that, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to do that as a project. Um, what you, you say, um, three magic words give you instant charisma. Um, if you can learn to become genuinely fascinated by the lives of other people, you will be a hugely successful dentist or hugely successful in anything you do. Um, politicians are masters at convincing us that they're genuinely interested in us. Now, in, in many cases there, they may not be. But if they can make you feel that way, they're going to be very successful. The, the three magic words are tell, me, are, are tell me more. So anyone can ask, anyone can remember this or utilize this in their own job. Oh, you're a foreman. Tell me more about your job. You know, what's, what's the most challenging thing about your job? What's the most frustrating thing about your job? Because uh, being a great conversationalist is not about being interesting or about reading books. It's about being interested and asking questions. That amazing points. V very yeah. good points. And uh, there's a big difference between do you want to see my vacation slides versus may I see your vacation slides? There's a uh, there's an interesting uh, piece of research I read on uh, uh, doctors and, and physicians and dentists where, you know, a huge complaint is, well, the doctor didn't listen to me. And they would talk to the doctors. The doctor's like, I'm listening. Hell, I'm taking notes. Look, I wrote down everything you said I didn't listen to. And what they found out is that if I say, um, if I ask you a question and I'm a doctor and I write it down and I'm satisfied, so then I go to the next question that they don't think you're, you're listening to. You have to throw something back. Like if you say, you know, mm -hmm. well, how long have you had this pain? Well, it's been hurting for about two months. Oh, okay, so two months. Wow, that's a long time. Then go mm -hmm. to your next question. But if you don't throw something yep. back, they're going to walk out of the room and score you as you did not listen. Along and, the same, same lines, eye contact is very important. And not all of us, we, we might think we're making eye contact with the patient, but so often, either the operatory is arranged in a certain way or for whatever, you know, we're looking up at the computer monitor, our back is to the patient, something as simple as making sure that you have eye contact. Or, or if you work in the uh, front desk to uh, stand if the patient's standing, to sit if the patient is seated, just to, again, maintain that eye contact. Same kind of thing in terms of establishing rapport, ma maintaining rapport. Very good. Um Three magic words persuade imperceptibility. That's going to be a it, tongue twister. Imperceptibly, yes. Imperceptibly. Um, that hooked on. I, I don't have my readers. Really paid off for me. Yeah. I, I I don't have my readers on. I should, my, I, I should just now that I'm fifty three or fifty two. I should just leave my readers on. Oh um. But 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 before you, before you answer that, I just want to tell you yep. one story on that. Uh, um, you know, sharing the thing I liked the most about um when I got into my exercise program, um I got excited about the Ironman challenge. And what was interesting is for 25 years in Ahwatukee, I have these great dentist buddies 
And, uh, and, our, and our activity was to go to sports bars and watch sports and drink beers and eat cheeseburgers and french fries and had a blast and loved it and that was great. And now um, I have a new set of, uh, or not new, but additional dentist friends uh, in the same area. Um, Lewis, uh, um, Brad Sandvik, right up the street, uh -huh. Lewis Core. And now we get together and we'll go on a, you know, 50, 100 mile bike ride, swim, a mile or two or whatever. And it's the same amount of giggling. It's the same amount of fun. It's just, you know, is whatever. But the thing I like the most about Iron Man is that it, it took me about a year or two to realize that, you know, when you're out there, you're playing and there's mm -hmm. so much to talk about with bike, swim, run, transitions, Iron Man, diet, nutrition, all that stuff. And a lot of times it was the only time in my life where somebody would say to you, well, what, what does that person do for a living? And you're like, wow. That's my friend for a year, and I don't even know. Because so many times, like, you walk into a party, you don't know what to say, so it's just like, mm -hmm. oh, what do you do? Well, I'm a dentist. What do you do? I'm an endodontist. And, and then it goes to, uh, you know, the, the your whole, um, there's stratification of income, or, well, if I'm a dentist and you're an electrician or you're a plumber, or, you know. I love Iron Man that it's so fun, and everybody's playing. No, no one even cares what you do from nine to five. And uh, it's just... Uh, that, 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 that's really an escape. In fact, that's, how, that's the only way I judge a movie. The only way I, I judge a movie, good or bad, is when all of a sudden the credits start rolling and you're just like, wow. And you look at the clock and you go, holy moly, 120 minutes just went by and I, I was in a trance. And there's mm -hmm. just a few people that can do that to you. A lot of other people, you're looking at your clock and you're looking at your time and you're like, well, hopefully this is the last scene or, and then, oh, it's another scene and it just seems going forever. But then there's those movies where it just mind trances you for, you know, 120 minutes. Those are amazing. But three magic words here. I'll put on my reader so I can read it. To persuade Im imperceptibly. Well, I, I show another video clip uh, in my uh, seminars from Candid Camera. Candid Camera, of course, was the first <laughs> reality show. I mean, young people today probably think that they invented reality TV. But in fact, reality television began with our parents' generation with Candid, candid Camera. And uh, my favorite uh, episode, there, there was, they, they had an elevator and they would film real regular people getting in and off the real elevator, but they would have fake people, people working for the show in the elevator. And uh, the people working for the show would face the wrong way in the elevator. They would be backwards, for example. And they would observe the behavior of the real people getting in and out of the elevator when they get into the elevator and they see people facing backwards. So what do the real people do? They face backwards because everyone else is. People like to do what other people do. It's human nature. So to persuade people imperceptibly, you can just say something like, most people choose. People want to do what other people do. So, you know, Mrs. Smith, most people take advantage of our 5% courtesy. If it's comfortable for them, you might want to do that. Or, you know, Mrs. Smith, most people choose the tooth-colored restoration. That's our most popular one. Um, if it's not already your most popular one, it will be as soon as you start saying that. Very true. Yeah. And, and, and um, my dad taught me that really early. All my friends had a curfew. And it was uh, mm -hmm. maybe 10 o'clock when you're a freshman or sophomore. Then it went up to like 1030. And then seniors could stay out to midnight. Not my old man. He, only, he, he didn't care about the clock. He thought... That was totally our, what it was a clock after the thing. Uh -huh. He said, who are you hanging out with? And I'd say, uh, Alan Funk. And he goes, you'll be home by nine o'clock. <laughs> I'm like, wah. And then if I'd say John Lease, who we end up going from seventh grade all the way into dental school. We graduated together in 87 in UMKC. He said, well, hell, if you're with John Lease, why would you have to come home? Hell, stay with him for a week. That's, that's good. Let, maybe he'll rub off on you. And my, my dad's whole control deal was eagles fly with eagles, turkeys fly with turkeys, and everyone else had this arbitrary time, like, okay, well, you need to be home at 11. Well, you know, hell, if you're John Lee, 11 o'clock, we might be, um, you know, figuring out how uh, his dad uh, raced pigeons. We might be uh, taking pigeon manure and building tomato pens. I mean, John used to grow these tomato plants that would grow like a tree. I mean, they would grow like three or four feet, and the tomatoes would all be like the size of softballs because we dig three-foot holes, and the bottom one foot was just pure pigeon manure, from his dad's racing pit. So, you know, so my dad was right. His dad used to um, brew his own beer 
So I learned how to make my own beer. So yeah. My, my head is spinning, imagining you in high school or, or even younger, had I grown up with you, what that would have been like. And, 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 I'll, and, I'll, and I'll take that around uh, on the three magic words of, um, you know, people like to do what other people do. I'll, I'll take yeah. the negative to that is um, when a staff cancerous attitude gets out of control, they mm -hmm. can start uh, that. And then that staff member turns Absolutely. around and says, I'm going to be um, blatantly, um, you know, um, insubordination and I'm going to come into work and just have a drama day and all this stuff. And then one by one, the other uh, staff just start turning around in the elevator and start being bad. And it's the CEO's job um, to be able to spot, identify that and get that person extracted. And I'm, uh, very, I'm very much so. Yeah, we talk a lot about getting the right people on the bus. There's a lot of focus on how do we find the right people to hire. But you're right, we, we need to spend more attention to removing some weeds from the garden. That, that's what Jack Welch called it. From and, his and, and that's why um, it's crazy when you have all these people backseat driving sports trades because they'll say, why are you trading these two people for that guy? Are you just crazy? Uh -huh. What they don't know is behind the scenes – what is that attitude with their fellow teammates and coaches and captains? And, and, and they, they might not care that you get a home run every damn game. You're just toxic and you're ruining the whole franchise. Right. That you see that often in sports. Yeah. I, I, I bet they have the most, I bet they have a lot of drama because they're all kids. Eight, you know what? 18 to 25. They're all making millions. They're all good looking. They're all on top of the world. I mean, could you imagine managing that? Yeah, but I mean, like Michael Jordan was a, a superstar who made everyone around him better, but there are also talented people that make others worse with their attitudes. I don't want to many, mention any names, but Alan Iverson comes to mind. Right, right. And, and, and how do you think Just, that's going to play over with the Patriots? Because that's in your backyard, uh, uh, Deflation Gate. Uh, do, do you think that will have a stinging effect on fans or the, 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 the brand? Or will the I, Patriots I, have a different brand? That, because it sounds like they deflated some of their balls. I, I have mixed feelings on that. Um, I, I think probably Tom Brady should have been more forthright. But on the other hand, it seems like a kind of silly infraction that I, I'm not clear on how that would even have benefited them. I, yeah. I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, I, I think that Clinton, um, I think Bill Clinton taught the, um, you know, he had to go through the pain of the dumbest, oldest lesson on work on earth. And is don't make anything you did wrong worse with following it up with a lie. Yeah. Because uh -huh. the, the planet, probably 6 billion out of 7 billion people believe in an afterlife, a God or something. And they all hate the sins, uh, but they all forgive the sinner. And if, when, if, if Bill Clinton, if they said to Bill Clinton, they would have walked up to him and said, uh, hey, did you have an affair with that girl, Monica Lewinsky? Right. If he just said, first of all, it's none of your damn business. And number two, why don't you live with Hillary? Uh, you know, our family dog jumped in her lap and froze to death and, you know, get off my case, leave it alone. People would have probably just like, you know, walked away. But he lied. I did not have sex with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. And that, that, was, that was what done him in. It was, it was the lie. You're right, and I'll tell you the truth. I still resent him for it because I just want to be able to be able to watch. I, I want to be able to watch the news without having to explain to my wife what oral sex is. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great so, one. But yeah, I mean, and and the thing is, with, with you're, you're absolutely Tom Brady absolutely should have been honest, and that will be the the, the sin here. But at the same time, I, I think football st strikes me as overregulated, and I'm, I'm just using that as a microcosm for our society in general, that every last little thing, uh, I, I think we could do with less regulation. But absolutely, he should have been honest and uh, forthright. He probably wasn't. And it's a shame because I, I'm not a huge uh, sports fan. I've gotten more into politics and away from sports. But what I observed from Tom Brady at the time is he's really a gifted communicator in, in many ways and full of charisma. And this probably would have been a great opportunity for him. You know, and I've seen it with uh, dentists uh, forever in my own backyard. About 18% about of Americans uh, are considered an alcoholic in their lifetime sometime or another, you know. And most of that's 80% of that's going to be alcohol and 20% uh -huh. everything else. So, it's, so it's, it's not particularly strange that dentists are 18%. It is strange that anesthesiologists are 38%. So that does show the libertarians that... You know, if you carry around a bag of narcotics all day long, like fentanyl and all these things, uh, you know, you double yeah. your addiction rate. And um, I just seen all the time where, you know, the feds will walk into some dental office in, in my backyard and, and he's been um, 
um, writing scripts for us. You know, he, he's been he's been stealing them, and they'll say, um, you know, are you doing this? And they say, and they deny it. So then the feds leave and they go to the board and they build this big case mm -hmm. and the guy just gets the hammer thrown at him. And about half the dentists say, I am so sorry. I, I don't know. I can't stop. And they just put their arm around him and hug him and say, you know, that's okay, dude. You know, the first time you took it, that was dumb, but now you're addicted and you need to get some help. And, and, and it's all love and love and love. And the boards are so sweet uh, to the people who say, yeah, I messed up. I got addicted to these Vicodin and I can't get off. And then the ones who lied and I played the Clinton deal, they just throw them through the ringer. So, you know, and the other thing with humans, their attention span is so short. If you totally screwed up, every PR firm in the world says, get it all out instantly because then the clock starts ticking. And then the next time North Korea launches a missile or Putin invades Chechnya or, you know, something grabs the news, they're going to forget all about you and your piddly little problem. Well, you're living proof, just like we talked about earlier, you were blessed with that. Uh, quality of wanting to be honest and direct, and it led to some short-term troubles with the uh, speaking dates, and now you're, I I'm assuming you are the single most successful dental entrepreneur there is, if, if there's one, <laughs> no. but if, if there is one that, that's more so, I, I just, I can't think of them right now, maybe there is. Well, you but, are uh, too kind, I, I can you, think You certainly show that honesty pays off in the long run. Yeah, and, and uh, so um, six magic words get you referrals without asking. Well, it goes back again to the non-confrontational desire that we have, uh, the fear we have of confrontation. There's a great way to, you know, we've all heard, we all know that the best way to build your practice is by referrals to ask good patients to refer their friends and family. A lot of us have trouble asking for what we want, which can be the key to success in anything that we do. So I just found a phrase that I thought will be extraordinarily effective for those of us that don't like to ask uh, or have that confrontation, which is if a patient compliments you or uh, if a patient compliments the practice, just say something like, Mrs. Smith, do me a favor. Don't keep, us a, uh, don't keep us a secret. Mrs. Smith, please don't keep us a secret. If you just say don't keep us a secret or something along those lines, you don't have to ask for anything. You'll send the message that you'd love it if the word were spread that you are welcoming of new patients. I, um, when, when you talk to other consultants and, you know, and, you know, they've all got their short list of their top three, top 10, whatever, whatever. I mean, everybody's got these things like, like say you have massive staff turnover. There's uh -huh. always one girl in there that's been there forever that doctor thinks is the best person in the world and you can't live without. So she's completely blindsided him, which is why all the other 10 positions are miserable because she's Jekyll and Hyde and you just have all these low hanging fruit, red flags. And every consultant has told me that in every office they've ever been into the first day they observe, they never ever have seen anyone ever ask a patient for a referral. And on the first day they, they've, they've never observed this. And, and the thing I want to um, talk about is um, add to that um, as Clinton advice you just said, is that women uh, make, about 90% of all the referrals to healthcare and education. Um, women have maternal instincts. Uh, women say 7,500 words a day, men say 2,000. Uh, it's the women making the doctor's appointments, the women telling their friends about it. You know, women is a completely different beast and women will never like you if they don't trust you. And if they don't trust you, they can't like you. And if they don't like you, they can't love you and your office and your staff and all that stuff. So when you advertise and you get in a hundred strange women in your office, that first appointment, uh, if you're put, if you're processing them fast or whatever, you get almost no committed treatment out of it. But if her friend refers her, you ask her for a referral. It shows humility. It's like, Hey, you know, I'm done fixing you up and, if you go get your teeth cleaned every six months the rest of your life with Sarah or Brady, um, I may I may never work on you again. Um, I haven't. Jan's been with me twenty eight years. I you know she doesn't have cavities. Um, do you have Do you know anybody who might that we could fix up, or do you, do you have any friends or whatever? And if they say yeah, then 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 that's when you that that's just the opening gate. Then you go to extreme referrals. Really, like who? My my friend Sarah. Well, if she's your friend, she's in your cell phone, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you, is she on iPhone? I mean, can you FaceTime her or can you only text or call her? Oh no, she's on iPhone. Fa will, you, will you FaceTime her and introduce her to me? I mean, I mean, the, the, the dentists that are extreme can get them committed while they're in the chair. You know what I mean? 
and, and it shows humility. I want it. But women, it's all about trust. And once you lie to them, they don't trust you. And once they don't trust mm-hmm. you, they don't like you. They don't love you. And the last thing you want is a bunch of uh, women coming into your office from a billboard up the street and walking in and saying, who is this guy? And what is this place? And what are they trying to uh-huh. sell me? And and, also, uh, and that's another the reason I'm huge on uh, having people check in on Facebook. Because the average mm-hmm. woman in America has 300 friends on Facebook. And, when, and half of Americans don't have a dentist. So they just say, wow, Sheila just checked in. Ah, at Patrick Wall's dental office. Huh. It's the social proof. P- people like to do yeah. what other people do. I, I think Facebook yeah. could crush the search engine industry. I really do. Mm-hmm. Google's all about speed and mass numbers. I don't, I don't think that's how humans work. I mean, you, you can be in the middle of Kansas and Google Mexican restaurant. It'll show you that you're 3.2 miles from a Mexican restaurant and all this kind of stuff. But th- that, that might work for brands like McDonald's or things like that. But I uh-huh. think what could be extra huge on Facebook, if you did a search for like dentist and it said, oh, you have 300 friends and 19 of them have checked in at Dr. Wall's office. And here's his deal. And six of your friends have checked in at Dr. Fran's office. And here's his deal. And then, then they're like, oh my God, 19 of my 300 friends go to this dentist. Hell, that's where I'm going. I mean, so if there's any type of needing trust, a social connection, um, look, look at women. I mean, the, the economists prove that when women go get their car fixed or call an a air conditioner repairman, they're more likely uh, to be told they need a repair they don't need. So, so I need an air conditioner repair service. Mm-hmm. I search on Facebook and I find out, oh, my sister's brother is an insurance guy. Now she's texting her friend, Megan, Megan. Can you have your brother come by? Because she instantly trusts her friend Megan's brother. And now Megan's exactly. brother's coming over and he doesn't want to piss off his sister's best friend and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, Google could totally crush any type of search that required trust. I mean, Facebook. The, the Facebook, yeah. Well, the best part about Facebook for me has been I, I used to be embarrassed by the stuff that would happen to me and how I was so awkward. Now I just think, the first thing I think of is I can post this, turn it into an awkward moment. And that humanizes you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and it's the comedian. Helps people connect. I've, uh, you know, I did, uh, I, my, one of my favorite hobbies is stand up, and I'm a regular mm-hmm. around the Phoenix, um, Scottsdale, Tempe. I, I just love that. <laughs> I just love it. And, and when you go into a dental seminar, they all know who you are. But when you uh-huh. go into a stage in Scottsdale, not one person there knows who you are. So it's just extra, extra fun. And every comedian's trick is the same thing. If, if I go into the stage, like, I'm a man, and I start saying jokes about women. Oh, my God, they just, just, just want to hurt you. Uh, I'm, I'm Irish. If I go out there and start throwing jokes about uh, Mexicans and Vietnamese, you know, they, they want to hurt you. And, to the, and the number one trick is just go out there and beat the shit out of yourself, and every one of your negatives is now your positives. And you just look in the mirror. What are your props? Okay, I'm short, fat, bald. I'm 50. I'm a grandpa. You know, just, just go through everything that went wrong in your life. And there's all your material. And people love to laugh at you. They don't really like to laugh at themselves. You know, they're not paying money for you to make fun of them. Ronald Reagan was so good at that. The self-deprecating humor. Yeah, self-deprecating humor. And, and, and the thing that I um, think that um, the biggest takeaways from the three greatest communicators I've ever seen in my life that everyone else abuses is uh, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, and Oprah Winfrey. What they do is when you ask them a question, they first answer it. If it's a yes or no, they'll give you yes or no. If it's up or down, left, right, whatever, they first answer the question. And you know, Ronald Reagan go, well, yes. And I'll tell you why. And then Bill Clinton come out there with his thumb and he'd bite his little there. He'd go, yes. And, and I'll tell you, Oprah Winfrey, absolutely yes and let me tell you why and everyone else especially doctors and politicians well when i need a root canal and he starts talking well you know the tooth is irreversible and it sends it hot and cold and it's in the percussion test and they're just sitting there like are, are do you not know or are you lying to me or you know like like do you do you believe global warming is caused by man and then they just start talking and talking and they're talking so right. and it's like dude answer the freaking question then explain. And, you know, do I need a root canal? Yes. And I'll tell you why. Then ramble Be- on. Beautiful. Yeah. Excellent. Um, when Reagan was asked in that debate in 84, when he was running for re-election, he was already the oldest president in history. He was 73. 
and he was asked that question about you know the age issue because there were two debates. At the first debate, Reagan didn't do well. He was stumbling through his answers. So all of a sudden, the question was, is Reagan, no matter how well the country is doing, is he simply too old now? So it was predictable that he would get asked that question. Then he famously answered, um, I will not exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. In other words, yes, I am old. He didn't deny it. He wasn't defensive. You know, is your fee, your fee is higher than other dentists. Yes, our fee is higher. Let me tell you why. Now people are receptive to hearing your, your story when you're not defensive. When you're and I'll give defensive. you another thing because you and I have lived through both those presidents. And by the way, Ronald Reagan was my first uh, great president. Uh, not that I believed in all his policies and all that, but um, when I grew up, you know, Vietnam War, um, the um, Nixon, uh, you know, Carter telling everybody to turn off their heater and, you know, and freeze to death. And I mean, I, I just felt like I was a, in a crap country. Uh, civil rights issues were crazy in Wichita, riots. And, and uh, I, I just, I mean, it was just horrible. And Ronald Reagan was the first one that just came out and made, made you just feel proud to be American. It was, it was the first time he ever made mm -hmm. you feel proud to be American. But I want to tell you one takeaway on how that leads to dentistry. And that is um, everyone knows well, you were talking earlier about leadership. You know, if the dog thinks he knows where he's going, right. um, everyone will follow. And Ronald Reagan, it clearly became apparent on some of his policies, like like Star Wars or whatever, that, you know, we weren't going to build in his eight-year career. We weren't going to put lasers up there and shoot down. You know, whenever it became really apparent that he was going the wrong way, the fact that he just, nope, wouldn't budge an inch, and we're still going, and we're full speed ahead, he wouldn't budge an inch, actually got more support than satisfying the intellectuals. And, and Clinton was so intellectual. He was a Rhodes Scholar. He was so smart. He was so well-read. And you know he was sitting in these all-night meetings and realized that, you know what, I am wrong, and I'm going to adjust course. So the next day he would intellectually go out there and adjust court. And probably it was the absolutely right reason to do it. And what did all the 330 million people say? Oh, there he goes again, waffling. He has no idea what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And the guy has, you know, he's just clueless. And I thought to myself, oh, my God. And you see that in dentistry. Well, you know, well, how much is the implant? Well, you know, well, the implant's 1,500. But, um, you know, if we if we had to do a bone grafting, then that, that could be 150. Well, am I going to have to have bone graft? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, when we got in there, you know, we could find that. <laughs> and, and, and the more intellectually correct you are, the patient's looking at you like, dude, have you ever even done this before? Whereas the smart surgeons who place all the implants, they just have one fee. Yeah, the, you mm -hmm. know, the implant, it's $1,500. A flat fee. A flat fee. And the dentist is thinking, some, I may lose money because I may bone graft, uncover. Three months later, the bone's gone. Have to regraft it, re-suture it. And so, some of these implants, I'm going to take a bath on. And some of them, I'm going to be an absolute cash cow. But I will make money overall on this flat fee, and I will sound like Ronald Reagan. I will sound like the lead sled dog. I will build confidence in my thousands of patients in my practice. I'm not going to go out there intellectually like Clinton trying to get you to explain everything that could go wrong, and, and every time something goes wrong, it'll be more unknown money and variables and freak you all out, and then you just sit there and say, well, I'm going to get a second opinion. I learned this in car school. I learned this in car school. I was uh, sleeping in on a Saturday, and my dad comes down there, wakes me up, and says, hey, Howard, good, good news. My buddy owns a car lot, and they're having a two-day training course for a bunch of new car salesmen. And I told him, I said, would you just let my buddy, I swear to God, he won't say a word. He'll sit in the back. He'll completely shut the blank off. Just let him sit in the back and take him. You know, so I, you know, I went to ride my bike all day. I think I was in like the seventh grade. I was, I was like crying and upset. And but anyway, I, it, the thing, the biggest takeaway I remember that is like a lady would come on the car and she'd see the car of her dreams. And she said, oh my God, I love it. And it's even got a sunroof. And then some idiot would say, well, actually, that, that's not a sunroof. That's a moonroof. Uh, did you want a sunroof or a moonroof? Now, now her excitement is all messed up, and now she doesn't remember if her friend has a sunroof or a moonroof. And now she's thinking, I'm going to make a bad decision, and maybe I should go back and get my sister or look at the car. And it's like, dude, she thought it was, uh, you know, <laughs> she was all happy. She almost bought a car, but you had to screw it up with more information. Well, in endo, you don't charge by the canal, you charge by the case. So it's really the same thinking. You know, it, it might be a very difficult case. It might be an easy one, but you don't charge extra because you found a fourth canal. So, you know, so your, your last deal, the best advice I ever got, and that's got to be your close. We're at 59 minutes, buddy. What is the best advice you ever got? First, try restarting. 
First try restarting. It works almost every time. And what, what do you mean by I'll, that? I'll, <laughs> whenever something goes wrong on the computer, what do you do? You, you restart. Reboot. It'll probably be better. But I'll, I'll try to make it more dental. Um, uh, there, there's a, a there's, there's so many things that we could talk about. But um, again, success comes from focus. Um, what are you willing to sacrifice to make that happen? Um, to give a dental, a, a dental tip for people, one magic word today. I think that's why you put it in your name, today's dental. We can do that for you today if you like. That can double your revenue right there. At Wall Family Dentistry, we go out of our way. If the patient's there, if they're ready, if we can find a way to make time to do it, then it saves so much time in the long run. The patient's right there. You don't have to reappoint. Hope that the patient comes back on time. Um, whatever you can do today is going to increase your revenue dramatically. Um, and and how, how do these people get a hold of your new ebook? Um, magic words it, and life lessons, what to say and what to do at work, at home, and everywhere. It's the best of office magic, and it's only $11, and it's available everywhere ebooks are sold. You can get it on Amazon, uh, iTunes, everywhere else that sells ebooks. You can get it from our website, officemagic.com. It's called Magic Words and Life Lessons. Um, you know what? Uh, I would, uh, my marketing advice to my, my buddy, you didn't ask for it, and you're uh, a better marketer than I am, but I think you should go on Dental Town and start a thread. There's 51 categories, and one of them is practice management. I think you should go start a thread and uh, it'd be your first post. Uh, you're kind of shy in that regard. And I think you should post a, uh, or no, no, you did post it. Did, did you post it? I, I've not posted this. I, I have posted over the years. Not uh, often. You, you I, haven't. You, I, what I was going with, you'd never done I would an online CE. Yeah. I know where I was going. You'd never done no, an online did, CE course. I did too. And you Wait. took it down. It's not there now. I don't know what happened to it. Oh, but was that because that was one of the first ones in like 2000? It was like 15 years old? No, it was uh, maybe five years ago or a little more, but it wasn't brand new. Huh, is, 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 do, let's do you track still, it down. Do you, still, do you stand by that course? It's a great course. Well, then let's get it up today. Let's do that. And, and what, what's the name of that course? I don't remember the name, but... Uh, it was Patrick Wall with, with uh, Lorraine Hollett. Patrick it was great Wall. stuff. Oh, you know what? I remember that. Didn't Rita put that up? Was it Rita? Yes, I think so. I think, dude, I think that was like 15 years ago or 10 years ago. It doesn't seem like that long, but maybe it let, was. Let, well, let, 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 let's okay. look at it. Let, let's look at it. And did you start okay. a thread on your book? I haven't. Um, I, I use Dental Town mostly as a reference. I, I usually lurk. I've not done a lot of original posting. Well, get but on there and say that. Howard made you do it so they don't think you're self-serving. Go in there or, or email me. Um, email me the write-up and give me a JPEG of your book. That's what we'll do. Email me um, um, the information and a picture of your book, and I will, I will make the post before I go to bed tonight, and I'll push it out on uh, Dental Town, Facebook, Google+, Twitter, and, uh, and, and we're out of time. We're in overtime, but I just want to say – uh, I just want to say, uh, dude, seriously, you had a huge impact on me and my practice going back when uh, Jan Sweeney and I heard you speak years ago. Uh, I still think of you as um, the first one making me rethink all my statements and became a statementless practice. And I can remember what the, uh, the pushback on that was, was the extreme. You had no statements. And, and how I got your message through to my staff, I said, well, you know, we don't have to get rid of all of our statements, but... We are doing 500 a month, like, just like he says. You know, can we shoot for uh -huh. 400? And it was making the goal going from 500 to uh, 400 to 300 that basically got us to just collect for our money first. I credit that for you. You made me a gazillion dollars on that. Uh, There's nothing wrong with making mistakes. The key is to recognize that each bill is simply a mistake and to learn from it instead of just thinking, oh, that's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. What could, what could we have done differently to prevent this? Well, hey, uh, yep. seriously, uh, thank you for all that you have done for dentistry. And uh, tell your brother Michael I said hi. And uh, tell Lorraine I will make sure I said he gets hi. in touch. Absolutely. And again, you literally have been our inspiration oh. and the biggest, the biggest influence on Wall Family Dentistry. <laughs> I bet that You're was your dad, people. not me. All right. Well, hey, thanks for all you do, buddy. And I'll see you on the boards. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye.